Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Racial Justice and Graduate Education What Are You Doing and What Could You Do session. Um, I will introduce Allison Jacknowitz, who's the chair of the institutional reps um, in a minute or so, but I just want to go over some logistical items first. Um, please mute yourself, turn off your camera during the panels um, so we could just see the panelists. Um, when the pa panels conclude, there will be Q&A time. Um, and Q&A time, please turn on your camera and unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, please use the raise hand functionality on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, so if you go to raise your hand to speak up, tap on the more button from the meeting controls at the bottom right corner of the screen and then select raise hand option from the pop-up menu. And the moderator in this case, Jane Linkove, or for the second, uh, for the second panel, Sarah Jane Brubaker, she'll call on you and uh, you can ask your question verbally. Um, and then I, there is a chat box, but if you could just leave the chat box for the panelists to discuss things that they need to and rather just ask your questions verbally. After both panels, there will be breakout networking time. Um, there will not be leaders for the breakouts, um, and you will be ran randomly assigned to a group. Uh, the idea is that to have to discuss issues that we cover in the panels in a, in a smaller, smaller group session. So the panel sessions will both be recorded and available for viewing later, uh, but the breakouts will not be recorded. A big thank you to all our panelists for participating on this important event. And without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Allison Jacknowitz, uh, Chair of the APAM Institutional Reps and Senior Associate Dean of Academic Affairs for the School of Public Affairs at American University and a professor in the Department of Public Administration and Policy. Thank you. Allison, it's all yours. Thank you, Tara. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. As Tara mentioned, I am the chair of the APAM Institutional Reps. And in the last APAM Executive Board meeting, I was asked to consider um, organizing a session on racial justice and graduate education for institutional reps. I brought this idea to the Institutional Reps Committee and it was very well received. We thought such an event would be a great opportunity for APAM members, including students, to openly share ideas and practices. We hope today's event is the first one of many and that schools will see APAM as a resource on racial justice issues and other pressing topics. I want to particularly thank the Institutional Reps Committee, including Jane Linko, Sarah June Brubaker, and Heather Campbell for helping to plan this event. I especially want to thank Tara Sheehan for her leadership efforts in getting this event off the ground. The Institutional Reps Committee is also pleased to organize a session at the fall conference on the future of MPP programs. Um, please consider registering for the conference and attending the session. I am now pleased to turn it over to Jane Linko, an Associate Professor and Graduate Program Director at UMBC. Thank you, Ali and Tara, um, for the nice introductions. I'm really happy to be here and grateful to our panelists today. I wanna say quickly that um, we have five panelists um, to discuss what they're working on in their graduate programs right now. Um, but when we proposed the panel, we had many more volunteers. So hopefully some of you who volunteered are in the audience. It was really exciting to hear how much was going on in this area within policy schools. Um, particularly since those of us who are on the committee were like, "Woo, nobody can do anything right now. It's too busy. Um, but there are, um, there are exciting things going on. Uh, so I'm briefly going to introduce the panelists and then they're going to have a chance um, to give you a summary of what they're working on in their programs. Um, and then I have some questions. So we'll, we'll circle back to the panelists and then eventually have time for Q&A at the end. Um, so um, we don't have applause on Zoom, I think, but uh, please help me in welcoming our panelists, uh, which is uh, Stephanie Aronson, who's the Vice President and Director of Economic Studies at the Brookings Institute. Um, Anil Deo Laliker, the founding dean of the School of Public Policy at the University of California, Riverside. Elise Harper Anderson, associate professor of urban and regional planning at the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs at Virginia Commonwealth University. Kathy Liu, professor and chair of the Andrew Young School of Public Policy at Georgia State University. And Maria Madison, associate dean of equity, inclusion, and diversity at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. Um, so welcome everyone. And in that order, um, Stephanie, Anil, Elise, Kathy, and then Maria, um, you each have about three minutes to um, to introduce us to the initiatives that you're working on in your programs. 
Great. Um, so I think I, I'm the one who's supposed to get started. I just want to first thank APAM so much for inviting me to this session. Although Brookings is not an academic institution, the economic studies program that I direct operates in a very similar fashion in the sense that we have individual scholars, uh, many of whom have PhDs who have their own research agendas. We also have a large number of research support staff and other operation staff who are working on eventing communications, fundraising and finance, who help us to promote our research and help us to have impact in the policy sphere. And we definitely see ourselves as partners um, with many people at policy schools around the country. So I just wanna start off also saying that prior to the pandemic and the protests for racial justice that rose over the summer, Brookings was already in the midst of a process for improving inclusion and diversity in our workplace. We, um, within the economic studies program, we put together working groups that uh, set aside IND goals that included increasing the diversity of our hires, both of the operations, research support, and scholar level staff, increasing the diversity of people we partner with, for instance, our co-authors and people we have doing our events, and increasing the inclusiveness of our workplace. And we put in place specific plans to gather data that would help us to know whether we were achieving, uh, achieving our goals and also plans for how to communicate our success or lack thereof to the program so that we'd be accountable to each other. And I would say that in the wake of the you know, protests that began this summer and just the greater reckoning with issues around racism, this kind of sparked further action in the program and we've really tried to take up the mantle in a few areas that we hadn't been doing as much work on. So first, although we are operating remotely, we have tried to facilitate conversations about racism, both within our program and in the institution as a whole. We have an anti-racism reading group that people can participate in. We've provided anti-racism training for all staff that they can attend. Um, John Allen, the president of Brookings, has also established a new presidential research priority on race, justice, and equity, and is dedicating funding to scholars who are working in those areas. So we're trying to really support researchers who are doing work in this area, and also to elevate the work of scholars who are outside of the institution who are working on these issues. We have also ta are talking much more now about how to make our research anti-racist. So. The economics program is predominantly staffed by economists at the scholar level. And I think there's a general acknowledgement that mainstream economics, in many ways, the theoretical models that underpin it are not very well equipped to incorporate structural racism. And I think that that has left our work wanting. And so we've been sharing readings that challenge some of the models or propose alternatives. And we've also been looking into developing guidelines for scholars that would help them to think more explicitly about race and racism in their research and trying to figure out how such guidelines could fit into our peer review process. And in this regard, I do wanna give a shout out to some of our peer organizations like the Urban Institute and the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, which I think are further along this than we are and um, have served as role models for us. And finally, I just wanna say, we're also thinking explicitly about how we can improve the diversity of the economics profession, in particular by making the pipeline more diverse. So this was something we were already looking at, but we've sort of renewed our efforts in this space, looking for opportunities to partner with local colleges that are supporting black and Hispanic students interested in economics and other policy fields, we're partnering with and supporting the AEA summer program and looking at other opportunities to set up internships and research assistant positions that can particularly prepare, um, prepare students who are underrepresented in the economics professions to do graduate work. And like I said, we were doing some of these things you know, prior to the summer, but our efforts have really expanded and gained new urgency in the current environment. Thank you. Um, Anil is next. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, just a couple of points I want to highlight. First of all, thank you uh, to uh, APAM for giving us this opportunity. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, UC Riverside, University of California, Riverside is already one of the most diverse campuses in the country. Uh, and uh, 
And so we start off with a very diverse student population, primarily at the undergraduate level, where I think uh, fully two thirds of our students are from underrepresented minorities and, and Pell Grant eligible. Uh, but what we have done in our School of Public Policy is we have ensured that, uh, you know, because typically in many universities, what you find is that as you go higher levels from undergraduate programs to graduate programs to faculty and staff, uh, diversity sort of, uh, uh, you don't get as much diversity as at lower levels. Uh, and, and in the School of Public Policy, when we set up our master's program, it was explicitly designed to appeal to uh, students from underrepresented communities who want to, who, who have already sort of, who are socially active, who have worked at the community level, who want to sort of uh, effect change. Uh, and our graduate program has uh, been very effective uh, and efficient in doing that. We have uh, at last count uh, three quarters of our students in the Masters of Public Policy program were, uh, were from underrepresented minorities and a half, exactly half of our women right now, of our students are women of color. Uh, so we have achieved a fair amount of uh, diversity, equity and inclusion in our, both our undergraduate as well as our graduate program. And of course we are striving to achieve that uh, within our faculty as well. Uh, but because of the audience that we serve already, uh, we, are further along than many institutions in terms of how we design our curriculum, uh, curricular programs uh, to, to uh, uh, appeal to this audience. Uh, and, uh, and so we have, uh, I think the uh, topic of uh, race, ethnicity, uh, immigration policies, uh, that's sort of a very important area uh, in our school. Uh, we have uh, three or four faculty out of a total of 20 who work in, in that area. We have uh, several others who work at the intersection of uh, race, ethnicity, and health policy, uh, education policy. Uh, and so we already have a lot of focus on, on issues of race, uh, social justice. Uh, but during the, during the summer, uh, arising from the George Floyd protests, our students who are again, very socially active, uh, were sort of uh, demanding to be heard loudly. And so what we uh, in the School of Public Policy did was we organized a large student forum where students, not just from our school, but from around the university uh, came and shared their experiences and uh, what they were going through. Uh, and out of that forum, we sort of developed specific uh, guidelines on what the school would do and how the school would respond to this. And, and one, of the, uh, uh, one of the ways in which we have responded is by uh, dedicating an entire seminar series this coming year on uh, Black Lives Matter and social justice, racial justice. Uh, that's one of the things uh, we have done. We have also, uh, requested all our faculty to review their courses and to explicitly incorporate uh, issues of racial and social justice in whatever they do. Uh, so for instance, even in when you teach environmental policy, uh, uh, social equity and, uh, and environmental justice are sort of our important issues and uh, they need to be reflected when you teach uh, Courses on environmental policy, for instance, uh, immigration policy obviously is is another obvious area. Uh, we have a center that's dedicated to uh, criminal justice policy, and of course, there again, uh, racial justice is extremely re relevant. But we have asked our faculty to look through all their courses to see if they can infuse the courses with issues of. Uh, 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 social equity, social justice, racial justice. And, and I think most faculty are very keen on doing that. So that's sort of one way in which we have responded in addition to uh, establishing a separate seminar uh, on Black Lives Matter. Uh, and then the last thing I'd like to mention uh, since uh, we have a time constraint is that uh, uh, quite by accident, uh, 
last week, just last week, a great opportunity fell in our laps because the county of Riverside, which is one of the largest counties in, in California, and one of the few counties that is growing in population. Uh, the county uh, board of supervisors reached out to us and they said that they were planning to hold a series of uh, listening sessions for the public, for the community, uh, to just talk about how they are facing these difficult challenges right now, the challenges brought about by the pandemic, by the economic crisis, and by the uh, uh, social reckoning. Uh, and they asked us if uh, the School of Public Policy could partner with the county on, on attending these listening sessions and taking stock of all these uh, citizen complaints, as it were, uh, and coming up with a set of new funding priorities and policies uh, and service, services that the county could offer uh, in the future. And, uh, and so we have actually used this opportunity to uh, uh, to sort of deploy many of our students in the master's program as well as in an undergraduate program. We have an undergraduate program in public policy, by the way, one of the only campuses in the UC system to have an undergraduate public policy major. But we have something like a dozen students involved in these listening sessions, taking extensive notes, and then uh, uh, working with the faculty to uh, develop a set of policy prescriptions uh, that we will then uh, discuss with the county and hopefully we'll sort of prepare a joint report at the end of it. So this was a great real world experience of, uh, of trying to implement uh, social justice issues uh, that sort of presented itself to our students and to us. So I'll stop there and I'm sure there'll be more questions later on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Elsie Harper Anderson from VCU who I think I may have accidentally called Elise, and I apologize if I did. No problem. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here and talk about the Wilder School. And um, I first have to say that uh, racial justice and social equity has been a defining characteristic of the Wilder School from its inception. Our namesake, Douglas Wilder, the first African-American elected governor, um, is a leader in the fight for racial equity, and um, that defines everything that we do at the Wilder School. Um, so, like I said, we've been actively engaged since the inception of the school. Um, one of the things that we've done is host or co-host many major events related to racial equity, including the Kerner Commission 50th anniversary um, conference, which we jointly hosted with the University of Minnesota, um, the Plessy versus Ferguson 125th anniversary project, which our Dean Susan Gooden um, collaborated with Sam Myers and John Powell on. Um, we hosted the Napa Social Equity Conference. Uh, Governor Wilder held a race in academia symposium. We also um, host or we have the Minority Political Leadership Institute within the Wilder School. Um, we have also um, host, uh, are part of PPIA and the Summer Institute there. Um, we've also won many awards related to race equity, uh, race, racial equity and social equity. So just to say that we've been engaged in this work for a long time. Um, what shifted with the brutal murder of George Floyd and several other um, events that happened during the summer um, was that we, we realized that we did not have a clear focus for our racial equity work. So at the university level, um, the president, VCU president Michael Rao, um, outlined his priorities for racial equity to the Board of Visitors. Um, and prior to um, all of these things that occurred in the summer, uh, VCU's Office of Institutional Equity had, um, had conducted a climate report to measure diversity, equi equity, um, inclusion, and engagement throughout the university. Um, but during the summer, when all of these things happen, um, and following the, the VCU president's report, our dean asked, what should we be doing in the Wilder School around these issues? Um, so what we did is held a virtual town hall 
in June with more than 50 faculty, staff, and alumni. Uh, we broke into working groups and generated a list of areas for improvement and ideas. And from there, the working groups um, formed um, to develop the Racial Equity Action Plan, um, and which is in the process of being completed. Um, so the purpose is to get our own house in order and to directly address um, some of the issues that were identified during the working groups. Uh, the key to this plan is that we're focused on action as opposed to dialogue. There are enough conversations going on around the country on Zoom. Um, there's enough dialogue, but this plan is really focused on what action items can we take over the next one to two years and over the next three to five years to actually address issues that are going on within the Wilder School, across the country, across the world. Um, the five areas of focus for our racial equity action plan it are, um, we have some cabinet level priorities, uh, student support is a core area, teaching and curriculum, uh, research, and community and alumni engagement. So we have those action areas which break down into 16 strategic goals. So we are in the process now of um, putting many of those action items um, into, uh, into play. Um, in addition to that, we've, we're doing a number of other things. For example, we have a doctoral lecture series, um, which we are dedicating to, um, we're, we're dedicating it to the theme of racial equity for this academic year. So all of our speakers will speak um, uh, on some aspect of racial justice and social equity um, and a number of other initiatives. Um, and I just wanted to point out that also uh, the, one of the ways that we keep track of the progress that's being made is that in our annual evaluations, all of the faculty, there's a section where they have to list um, anything that they're doing related to um, racial equity and social justice and we keep uh, a running, we keep track of that um, across all of our faculty. So those are just some of the things that we're doing. Uh, we're doing lots of other things in the Wilder School. So I look forward to talking more about it in the discussion portion or in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is um, Kathy Liu from Georgia State University. Hi, um, good afternoon. Thanks to APAM and to all the organizers for putting together this event. I'm certainly pleased to be able to come here and share the experience of um, the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at the Georgia State University and what we're doing in, on this front. Uh, as you know, Georgia State University is an urban research university. It is located right here in downtown Atlanta. So um, in a way, it really provides, it both has the legacy of the civil rights movement and also it has um, really kind of this geographic location as well to witness a lot of the current events, uh, which kind of in a way also shape our policy discussions in the school and in the university as well. So as you know, the university itself um, is a very diverse University, we're probably one of the top universities in the country to graduate um, underrepresented students, first generation students. So this has been ongoing, but the current events really kind of in a way um, pushed our, our efforts uh, further along those lines. Um, the university recently started a task force on racial equity uh, and diver uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and actually has an office and a new senior leader to guide the campus-wide efforts uh, in this general area. And what ended up with the, all these efforts and campus-wide conversation around these issues is a comprehensive database, uh, which includes all the related programs and initiatives that are going on across different schools, departments, research centers and units uh, in the university. So a lot of the times we work in silos, but I think this is a very nice way of summarizing, you know, what the different uh, places are doing and it creates this database uh, 
that people can search and can look for um, you know similar programs and uh, areas where people can work together and collaborate. So I think that was uh, very helpful for us to at least know what's the landscape of things at the university level. Uh, also at the university level, um, they created a task force on the new generation of faculty. And this is a task force that look at what are some of the issues that facing faculty, especially minority and under underrepresented faculty. And this commission comes up with a, um, I mean, task force come up with a commission report, which is also available on the university website to really see what are some of the challenges, what are some of the issues um, that are facing these faculty members and what are some of the actions that can be done uh, for them. So this, I just wanna briefly talk about at the university level, what are some of the central efforts that are done uh, for the whole campus. Within the Andrew Young School, I think similar to Elsie's situation, just uh, based on our namesake, Ambassador Andrew Young, we also have a long tradition of working on issues related to social equity, racial equity, and diversity. So again, I think we have also, through the current events, consolidated some of our efforts and thinking about how in some new ways that we can further um, continue along those traditions. So one thing that we did um, right after the recent events is that we had, had a virtual town hall meeting with Ambassador Yang to discuss some of the issues. And this is, a, this is a town hall meeting for all the faculty members, for students, as well as to other alumni and friends of the Andrew Yang School. So we had some serious talk as well as other conversations along these issues of what's going on. And I think one of the questions is how is this similar or different from some of the events that happened decades ago so we all had some kind of discussion um, and, and this really i think a beginning of what we can uh, potentially do into the future the the college also um, started a a pipeline program um, to hope to um, invite and introduce more um, underrepresented students into the field of public policy. We actually have uh, four departments within the school, public management policy, economics, social work, and criminal justice. So all of which are quite relevant to the current debate and all of them, uh, we actually use the pipeline program to introduce more students to all these different majors and degrees and programs. Um, the department I'm in, department published public management policy we also applied to host a public policy camp um, with APAM, which unfortunately has to be postponed, hopefully to next year, but we'll see how things go. Uh, this I think is also a, a, a good example of a program to introduce underrepresented and minority students to public policy as both a career um, and a, a degree. Uh, another thing I want to mention is that we know we now all uh, ask because we already have a very diverse student body and a, a fairly diverse faculty body as well. But through the university, we're now all required, all the search committee chairs and all the department chairs are required to under through a rigorous uh, training for faculty search. And I think this is an important process for us to ensure that what are some of the important things for us to be mindful of and to be um, to be conscious of while we're doing the faculty searches to make sure that we can um, actually ensure that we get the um, the diverse and, and, and qualified uh, faculty and, and ensure a very fair process. Uh, so that's another thing. So we're already, I think, both in terms of uh, research, both in terms of teaching, in terms of service, uh, we are actually doing uh, various things in, in the general issues of diversity, um, equity, and inclusion. But I guess the question is, you know, what are some of, some of the things that we can do more um, to, to, to really improve? Um, on these dimensions. So we actually also did a survey of our current students and alumni to 
uh, to see how they feel about the climate of the school is whether they feel that they are included. And we don't have a whole lot of um, responses, unfortunately, um, but I think the responses we have give us some ideas of what, what are some of the more things that we can potentially do. So lastly, I just want to mention on the teaching front, um, because this year is also the year we're doing the NASPA self-study. And we did realize that diversity is a key word that we can further expand in our, our graduate programs, um, the MPA program. So we are potentially thinking about starting a new course called Managing Diversity. And this, is a, this will be a course that to teach the students how to really um, deal with the more diverse post, uh, population, the community, uh, workforce, and, and so on and so forth. So we are in the process of, of thinking about that um, and just another, uh, another effort that we're doing right now. So I'll stop here and look forward to uh, some questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and last to introduce your program to us is uh, Marie Madison, um, Maria Madison from Brandeis. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be on this panel with, and with all of you in the audience. And uh, I'd like to also send a special thank you to um, Mike Doonan and um, our Masters of Public Policy program. Uh, I am located at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management. It's a graduate school on the Brandeis campus. And my specific role as Associate Dean for Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity was in response to a clarion call from students, um, in particular from students uh, that included both our graduate school and undergraduate school. We refer to it as our Ford Hall movements. And um, that movement actually began decades ago with, for example, Angela Davis ushering in the first black uh, department on a college campus way back in 69 and then again in 72. And so the through line is long and the through line of the need for this work on racial justice and promoting um, diversity, equity and inclusion within schools uh, really dates back a long time. And though there are certainly immediate uh, examples of the urgency of this topic through the lives of Breonna Taylor and so many others, it really has its roots um, over not just decades, but also uh, centuries. So with that said, our school's motto is knowledge advancing social justice. So we always try to center our strategic plan on how true we are keeping to our motto. And in particular, that means we always want to make sure that we address the uh, root cause uh, or the problem statement in everything we do. So for example, we know that racial and intersectional disparities are solidified through the school system, where for example, less than a third of black students attain a bachelor's degree or higher compared to almost half of white students. And that we know that that is associated with a heightened level of debt due to the college um, predatory loan, student loan process. So, we try to create a structured approach that is um, within our strategic plan. So I'm going to just describe what's in that strategic plan in three major buckets. The overarching plan um, helps us to look at the institutional context, the structural diversity of our institution, and the psychological as well as the behavioral dimensions of what our work needs to focus on. So by the institutional and the structural, uh, we use the HEED, the Higher Excellence, uh, the Higher Excellence in Education um, framework set out by the AACU. Within that HEED, there are about 130 or so metrics, and we map ourselves to those metrics because they also help us see how we're performing against other institutions who use the HEED. They help us create goals, they help us track and monitor our progress, and they also help us to define and prioritize interventions and that we are tracking those and working with all of the groups within our school uh, regularly uh, during the year. During or, or particularly as related to the psychological and the behavioral dimensions, we use climate surveys to track, monitor, and then create workshops and interventions related to the results from the climate surveys. 
So we've divided our climate surveys in half. We do uh, the climate surveys for students um, one year, and then the goal is to do the climate surveys for faculty, staff, and researchers the alternate years, and then track every other year. Of course, with COVID, we kind of got off schedule, but that's the goal in general. So then within that, um, our climate survey has helped us to zero in on how to prioritize issues within the community. And the categories we zero in on that we've gleaned from the results from our climate surveys where we have 60 to 70% participation are issues of demographics. Are we diverse in our faculty, staff, student and researcher population? Uh, and then we map and set targets related to where we want to grow in increasing a multicultural representation. And we train people in recruitment and retention approaches, search committee training on debiasing the process. We zero in on the vulnerabilities of our population. By vulnerabilities, we map and track issues of health, safety, wellness, employment, housing, and food security. That of course also goes back to making sure that we are uh, trying to not put students at greater financial risk or greater health and mental health risk. So we try to map um, those aspects. We also uh, use as one of our major variables in understanding and tracking the community's climate, uh, belonging and inclusion. And Within belonging and inclusion, we use the experiences with discrimination, perceived or real, but self-reports of experiences with discrimination. We track and monitor those. And if we're mandated reporters, we follow up as uh, specifically as we can. And if we're not, we certainly try to provide resources and referrals, both anonymous as well as um, directly to our OEO officer. And then in the end, we also want that overarching net promoter score, right? So we measure satisfaction. How satisfied are you with your experience with being within our school? So I'm just gonna end with just a few examples of our interventions, some of the things we do. We do something called the Sankofa Community Conversation Series. Within that, uh, our most recent one, for example, includes a series, uh, a webinar session called Sick and Tired of Being Sick and Tired, quoting Fannie Lou Hammer, and we, included um, a multidisciplinary panel of economists uh, as well as uh, legal and um, a historian. And within that discussion, we highlighted what we viewed uh, were not just the issues in uh, racial inequities in our society, but tried to list specific ways in which we can, working together, close those inequities. We also have promoted a community reading process by which we had a committee select a book that the whole school uh, is reading called for this year. It's from hashtag Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation. And we uh, host community readings both through orientation, faculty meetings, our education steering community, our town halls with the author most recently, and then host breakout room using the Zoom community conversation approach, breakout room discussions to further develop plans on how to address some of the issues that are raised in that book. We host committee uh, discussions and processes and work groups on decolonizing our syllabi that uh, we work on with the faculty uh, to address issues of implicit bias and then how that plays itself out in the scholarly work that we use. Uh, within our classrooms and how to diversify the syllabus. We also are uh, creating a trans, uh, transformative justice team to help and address issues of um, discord between campus policing versus campus safety and alternative approaches to that. And we um, track and monitor all of those. I'm going to close on that because I think I've hit my three minute point, but I look forward to the Q&A um, process. Thank you. Thank you. So it turns out that all of our speakers have programs that are so inclusive um, that uh, that um, everyone needed more than three minutes. And I think that's fine and very helpful. Um, so I'm going to ask you next to give some quick advice 
Um, to those people, um, those of us who might be beginning a process, who might be seeking to get started, um, what your organizations have been involved in in quite some time. So I'm going to ask you first, like what, you know, we know that we should have listening sessions, we know we should do climate surveys. What specifically is like the most useful piece of data that you found that helps you identify internal problems and, and then start to think about solutions? Um, keeping in mind that like, I'm scared to have a meeting, um, that the meeting will be a waste of time. So um, just, just a little advice on how to get started with something that you found really useful in terms of a type of data or feedback. Um, and I'm going to start this time with Anil. Uh, well, I mean, I was going to say, of course, you have to have listening sessions first. But, but I think, uh, again, it depends on what kind of uh, DEI efforts you want to begin with. Uh, if you want uh, to simply increase your uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, minority representation in the representation in the faculty, that's one thing. Uh, but if you want your students to have real world experience in, uh, in inclusion and diversity, uh, uh, like I said earlier, uh, working with community agencies, with community partners, uh, with public agencies. And so the listening sessions, in, in a sense, should go beyond just your school and your faculty. Uh, they should involve community partners. Because we have found in our school uh, that uh, community engagement really uh, provides uh, a much more substantive uh, experience uh, in DEI-related activities to our students and to our faculty. Thank you. Elsie, do you want to answer the same question? Sure. Um, I thought it was a useful process at the Wilder School to focus our discussion um, on action as opposed to just talking about what is going on, what can we do, and let us think about what actions we can take. And I think that really moved everyone toward thinking in the mode of solutions as opposed to just going around and around with the conversation. And um, it also spurred creativity and innovation in how we address some of these issues. So I think if we had not been focused on action um, specifically and explicitly, um, some of those innovations would not have happened. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, actually, I, I think, Jen, this is a good question because I um, understand sometimes if we have too many of the conversations and meetings, it can be a burden for people. I think one thing that Jen Jiang School did what could be useful, uh, instead of having a meeting and call people, which we do have too, I think one potential thing you can do is to have these online what do you call it, like a discussion board or um, submission form or something where um, people can just anonymously submit their thoughts and their opinion. And sometimes you can get more candid opinion and thoughts through this channel than having people in the same room or on virtual um, kind of a meeting have to see each other face to face and say it out loud. Um, I actually think that the school collected quite some interesting information that way. Um, so that, that could be something to consider as well. That's really interesting. So people can participate kind of when they, when it strikes them. Yeah, it's just say you have it, we have a window of have it open for five days or even more, right? But you just continuously collect information. So it's just like we have an, any kind of online submission form that you anonymously just say what you want to say, answer a few questions and hit the submit. Thank you. Um, uh, Maria is next. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with um, everything that's been said. I also think we are at a phase in our school where diffusion innovation is key. And what I mean by that is we uh, or I can create a platform so that everyone understands the problem. And, and in my mind, the problem is structural racism, for example. But that after we've created the platform, it needs to be scaffolded to existing committing committees such that it's a standing agenda item on existing meeting um, uh, settings. 
So it's not artificial, it's not an add-on, and it's not on the shoulders of one person. Everybody takes a responsibility for it and organically places it in the standing meetings and committees and groups like town halls, education mm -hmm. steering committees, program committee meetings, such that we can provide prompts and questions uh, or even an agenda item language for those groups, but that it should be within the sinew of what normally happens in the institution. Thank you. Um, I'm going to throw out another question and then let Stephanie answer first, um, which is for, um, you know, for organizations that are that are focused on um, increasing diversity, recruiting students, recruiting staff, um, stakeholders, uh, researchers, um, what are the kind of institutional obstacles that you have found that you encounter kind of after you have have opened up that process um, for the students, um, for the faculty kind of as as you're um, diversifying um, your organizations that way. So I think I just want to chime in one thing on the last question, yeah, which is when we have facilitated these discussions within our program, one thing we thought a lot about, what are the power dynamics within the, the program and who will feel comfortable speaking up at meetings and not? And so I think that just planning meetings thoughtfully, thinking about who should be at each meeting, are you mixing scholars and non-scholars, supervisors or not? There are times when different structures are appropriate, but it definitely will affect the dynamics and the type of information you get. And so I just think being really thoughtful about, um, about how you collect the information, you know, whether, like Kathy said, you use something anonymous sometimes, um, depending, you know, things where everyone's together can build a lot of team spirit, but it can also create some awkward situations. Mm -hmm depending on the power dynamics. And so I do think we just have to be thoughtful about that. I think with regard to some of the, if I understood the question correctly, some of the challenges, you know, we faced, I would say that, you know, for Brookings in particular, we are, you know, not a very diverse institution mm -hmm. that we are, um, you know, and that making sure that we have the networks to really, um, be able to partner with other organizations effectively to, you know, we have a great Rubenstein Fellowship that brings in young scholars with a focus on scholars who are underrepresented in the fields that we work in. And even just getting the message out that these things exist, that making people know that we um, are focused on these issues, I think that that can be, you know, has been a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. um, I think that scholars who are interested in this, you know, in working on anti-racism, it's a small group. And so making sure that we have good, you know, again, just good partners outside of the institution that they know that within the institution, this work is valid um, and, you know, is valued. So we also have a similar thing where scholars now have to report on what they're doing for our IND initiatives, what they um, are doing around promoting the diversity of our partners and um, their own work on anti-racism, you know, so that people feel that they're being held accountable for these things and that it's, you know, they understand that this is a serious part of our values. Thank you. Um, where are we on here? Um, oh, so circling back around, Anil, do you want to um, address that question too about the after yeah. you honored? Yes. After, after, you, you, after you diversify. Uh, also, we are on the challenges question mm -hmm. still, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, two quick points I wanted to make. One is that uh, many of us have undergraduate populations that are very diverse. But as you get up to the uh, to graduate education, master's programs, PhD programs, you find much less diversity. And one of the reasons is that um, there is this implicit assumption in American academia where you sort of shy away from taking your own students in, in your graduate program. You encourage students, your own students to go elsewhere. And we have found that actually, uh, if you want to increase diversity at the graduate level, uh, some of the best ways you can do that is by building a pipeline from your undergraduate program. And that's what we have done. We have actually strived to build a pipeline 
uh, of students from our undergraduate program into our graduate program. And that's how we have achieved diversity at the graduate level. Uh, we are uh, in the final stages of uh, approval uh, for a five-year bachelor's uh, MPP program in public policy uh, at UCR. Uh, and that would again take advantage of uh, of this pipeline. The second quick point I want to make is that it's always difficult, I think, uh, when you are recruiting faculty. Uh, there's always, uh, uh, depending on the composition of faculty in your, in your program, uh, faculty from many disciplines uh, always have this notion that, you know, uh, administration always puts on all these uh, uh, diversity constraints on the faculty hiring process and and many faculty uh, especially those who have been trained in traditional disciplinary uh, uh, subjects have this view that there is a trade-off between uh, equity and sort of uh, quality mm -hmm. uh, and that faculty should be free to choose the best person available for that position without consideration of any other constraints and and i think it's a matter of uh, uh, convincing people that, look, uh, uh, diversity and quality are not necessarily a trade-off. Sometimes you can actually uh, uh, get the best quality and have the most diverse faculty. Uh, and and it's, it's not easy. It is challenging because many faculty have this preconceived notion that uh, administration is impinging on their freedom to choose the best candidate uh, out of the pool. But many times, I mean, the pool itself is has been constrained uh, because of factors that uh, we may not be aware of. And so I think uh, very often it's a question of making sure that you have actually the right pool of applicants to begin with. Maybe you didn't try hard enough to uh, get the, the, a diverse pool. And so then you are sort of choosing amongst a restricted pool anyway. Uh, so I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. I'm seeing from the comments that um, people in the audience are eager to ask questions. So I'm going to end my Q&A period. Um, and I see a hand from uh, Nina Estrella Luna. Do you want to unmute your microphone and turn on your camera so you can ask your question? Sure. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, oh, good. Um, I'm not using my regular mics. Um, I, I have a question about um, all of these task forces that um, were being described and some of them are focused on or at least incorporate this idea of well, we need to understand the experiences of students of color, underrepresented students, faculty of color, underrepresented faculty. And it just seems to me like there have been decades and decades and decades of research on this. I mean, the, the, the book, um, uh, the name of the book is um, Presumed Incompetent is in its second edition. But th I feel like this is not new information. So I'm curious, if, for, for those folks who have been doing this, is there something different that you're learning that isn't already out there in the you know, half century, if not more, of research on this? All right, who wants to field that one first? Maybe Elsie? Thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking about that. Um, I do think that that um, every time period brings its own unique framing and challenges. Um, the time period that we're living in right now, where we have a pandemic and an economic crisis and a health crisis and racial unrest all together brings a unique set of challenges to our students that we have to understand within the context of what they're living through, not what people lived through 10 years ago. So um, I know this is an extreme situation, but I think um, in every time period, this, it's, it's, it's this, the same basic um, kind of um, issues, but they evolve with time and we need to be conscious of context and, and, and how we address them. Right, any of the other panelists want to answer that question? Well, I'm going to answer the question with a question. Sorry. Interrupt um, yeah, I think that the answer comes from a multidisciplinary lens. And whatever our backgrounds are or our school's academic focuses, I think we need to promote history. And I think we need to found or ground this work 
in, for example, hashtag 1619 and express, you know, that since it's been centuries, what's it going to take for change right now? Um, I'll, I'll stop there. All right, is there, uh, you can raise hands if you have questions, if you put them, I don't see any hands raised now. I see questions in the comment, but I don't see hands raised. I, I actually saw a question in the chat related to the um, thinking about anti-racism in your research guidelines that we're developing within the economic studies program. So I just want to say that we're not far along enough in that process to um to have anything to share it might be that um i could put you in touch with people at some of the other organizations we're working with who are further along in their development and might be willing to share something if you reach out to me whoever asked this question i'm happy to uh try to facilitate that connection uh if i may also chime in i wanted to uh, i don't know how many of you have done that but uh, the deans of the four schools of public policy in the University of California system came out with a uh, forceful public statement that we have uh, tried to disseminate widely about their opposition to the uh, OMB's guideline that uh, training on uh, critical race theory not to be included in federal training uh, of employees of federal employees. Uh, and so we have come out very forcefully against that uh, OMB directive, saying that uh, it is ridiculous to argue that teaching racial justice to federal employees and, uh, and civil servants is anti-American in any way. Uh, I think more uh, people need to come out more strongly uh, against some of the uh, efforts that are being made in the current administration. Uh, to sort of suppress uh, issues of and discussion of racial justice. Thank you. Um, Oki, is, am I pronouncing your name right? Oki okay, and Yaya has a question. Yes, this is Oki okay, and Yaya. Thank you for having this, this much needed conversation. Um, in, in addition to what I posted in, in the chat, I think that question was answered um, to some degree in terms of the extent to which uh, there is there is keyword um, intentionality around the recruitment and retainment of faculty, postdocs, et cetera, right? That's, that is critically important. Uh, I am a former house and, house and Senate staffer on Capitol Hill. I'm currently also getting a doctorate in health policy. Uh, and so from my standpoint and my background in terms of how do you create, how do you strengthen and lengthen the pipeline of black and brown people to get to Capitol Hill, for example, and or as academics, where in the curriculum can we include the legislative process, literally teaching the, the, the policymaking process? Because we you know we can talk about civic engagement and, and how that has been um, a debacle from grammar school, but at this point in this particular space and context with, with other academics, where is the content around teaching about how to advocate, teaching how to meet with members of Congress, teaching how to meet with state legislators, teaching how to meet with local council members, right? That is a critical missing component that has to be unpacked and embedded into the curricula writ large. I'll, I'll pause there, thank you. All right, we have uh, one minute if a member of the panel um, wants to answer that challenge. I just want to, I'll hear that as our challenge. Um, I want to chime in on that and to say two things. Um, one, you spoke of um, black and brown um, and people of color in um, public administration. I, I think the issue starts with, or one of the key uh, barriers is admissions. Um, and we start with admissions. How do we um, look at uh, applicants. What do we value? What kinds of knowledge do we value? Um, how are our admissions um, committees? Um, who's on the committee? How do they relate to the applicants? How do they rate and evaluate um, the applicants in terms of their backgrounds and experiences? I think that is critical to um, addressing 
um, system, uh, uh, institutional injustices because we need more um, in the pipeline to become faculty, public administrators, but in order for them to get to that level, they have to be admitted into our programs. And we need to um, think about, you know, what, what our criteria are there beyond just what were your grades and what was your GRE scores, read deeper into the statements. What kind of perspectives are we bringing into the field? Um, as the PhD director um, and having sat through a number of admissions processes, both at VCU, at Berkeley, at Michigan, at a number of universities, I can say that the field looks like um, whoever we let in. So if we are at the admissions <laughs> process limiting the perspectives that are being brought into the field, um, the policies that we make after that, the way our institutions are run reflects that, limited. So that's my last Excellent. One. Thank you, Elsie. Yeah, I think the worst thing we can do is uh, recruit for diversity, but refuse to admit. Um, that is a, a, a both in faculty and staff and um, and student recruitment as well. Um, so we have to wrap up. Unfortunately, I want to thank the panelists and the audience and hope that everyone will stick around for the students who are coming up next to respond to what we've said here and to add their voices to the conversation. Um, there is a lot going on in the chat about resources, so hopefully the Institutional Rep Committee um, can work with APAM about getting a place for all these resources to be available to everyone. Um, I think that that would be, that would be definitely great, like, you know, even if we can share, like, surveys that we've done of students and things like that, um, so that we can have the best tools available. So thank you, everyone. Um, I think we can clap in Zoom. <laughs> Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Tara, I believe, to introduce panel two. Are we going to? Sure. I can't see anything in the, in the Zoom screen. Thank you, Thank you panelists. Uh, it was an interesting conversation. Um, I'm going to introduce Sarah Jane Brubaker from VCU, who's going to moderate our student panel. Thank you. Thank you, Tara, um, and everyone else for joining us today. I'm Sarah Jane Brubaker from the L. Douglas Water School of Government and Public Affairs at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. Um, today we have four students um, on our panel. Um, they are Rudy DeLeon Dinglis from University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Tina Fletcher, who's a student at University of Pennsylvania, William Jackson from Florida International University and Simran Kaur from Miami University of Ohio. Um, so we're going to have each panelist um, talk for a few minutes um, to kind of introduce themselves and talk about what their schools or organizations are doing or what they wish their school and organizations were doing to address racial justice. So we'll start with that and then we have a few questions um, for them. So. Um, I guess we'll start with uh, Rudy, if you're there. Wonderful, thank you, Sarah Jane, for your introduction. And thank you again to APAM for putting this event together and to Dr. Jane Linkov and UNBC School of Public Policy for including me in this conversation. Um, as mentioned, my name is Rudy Delian Dinglas and I am currently wrapping up the last of my classes in a doctorate program in public management from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Outside of this, I work as a senior advisor for the Johns Hopkins University Center for Government Excellence, where I advise government leaders across the country in the state and local levels for them to use data and performance management um, to drive operational excellence. Prior to joining Johns Hopkins University, I have over a dozen years of experience between the private sector and also working for the city of Baltimore and also the District of Columbia with a specialty in special projects and performance management. So just as we are here today, um, talking about the topic of racial justice and DEI, this is something that's been at the forefront of UMBC. This past summer, Dr. Freeman Rabowski, president of UMBC, released a comprehensive statement on this very topic and the university's role and responsibilities to this regard. It's called This Time in America from June 2020, and I can send the link in the, in the chat box after my introduction. But my biggest takeaway from Dr. Rabowski's statement both as a practitioner and an academic, is that the very first thing we can truly do is to acknowledge that we as a campus, regardless of institution and we as a community, still has a lot of work to do to address and dismantle structural racism and racial justice. 
that we must take action within the walls of our campuses, regardless of what school we're in, and that we can do this through our jobs, our internships, volunteerism, our communities, just to name a few, to address the impact of this racism and inequality in every term. And at the same time, as students of public policy, that we must fully understand our position in society and our role in the process. Just to highlight some of the things that UMBC has done so far this summer specifically, the Division of Student Affairs has developed a five-part workshop series focused on equipping faculty and staff with the tools and skills to engage in ongoing advocacy, self-work, and also self-care in response to ongoing racial injustice in our current climate. There's also what we call the Freedom Fridays um, that we do weekly on WebEx, which is a student-centered program designed to provide a virtual space to have an open dialogue about social justice and identity-based issues. And also we have the Black Faculty and Staff Association, which has held community care space, which provides room for facilitated discussion, focusing on self-care, healing, shared processing, and resources sharing to support community members who may be feeling overwhelmed and angry, despite what's all going on. So these are just some of the efforts that the university has undertaken as a whole. The UMBC School of Public Policy, through our director, Dr. Susan Starrett, who I also believe is in this call, has also issued a statement echoing with Dr. Rabaus, uh, what President Rabowski has said in his statement, that through the study of public policy, that we as students and we as faculties must work to enable hope in our, in our studies and in our work, to weave our grief and our rage into fostering this hope to enable us to push for better outcomes as academics and as practitioners and in many times as both. So I'm looking forward to our discussion on this um, this afternoon. Thank you. Tina, would you like to go next? Can everyone hear me? I'm in rural Arkansas, so if my internet gets bad, please feel free to let me know in the chat. Uh, so my name is Tina Fletcher. I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm studying education policy and my dissertation focuses primarily on black teachers and their experience with the Praxis licensure exam. Um, I am the only African American student in my department and our department doesn't have uh, faculty, any faculty of color. And so this was a very interesting opportunity to me when Leslie sent the email out and I'm so grateful for her and Tara for including me in this, uh, this opportunity. So I wanted to start by saying when the, when the George Floyd incident happened on May 25th, um, I was pleasantly surprised that our university, including our president, Amy Gutman, who's the longest serving Ivy League female president, and our dean at the School of Education, Pam Grossman, they responded immediately. We had personal emails from them speaking not only about the situation going on with COVID, but also speaking directly to African-American students. Someone posed a question earlier in the chat about just aggregating the data when you're talking about people of color. And that's something that I look at in my research often. And it felt so great to have the president of the university specifically say, our thoughts are with our African-American students. Because when things like this happen, I oftentimes feel like we get caught in the shuffle of kind of putting this umbrella over all of the different minority groups. So I wanted to first mention that. Um, I also wanted to share, just like Rudy said, our institution was very swift at creating a plan of action. Within a week of the actual George, George Floyd uh, situation, we had an email from our president with a line of activities, um, a list of resources that were already available at the institution for students of color, whether it was centers or extra resources from our our counseling services, they created an avenue for people to reach out and have support immediately. Um, I also wanted to mention, and this is a name I may say often throughout this, um, and if, if you don't <laughs> take anything else from my remarks, um, I want you to look up Dr. Howard Stevenson. He is the only full uh, professor, uh, the only African-American male full professor in the School of Education, and he has been doing this work for decades. So Howard Stevenson, you know, the, the president and the dean leaned on his work that was already established. He already had programs coming up talking about racial injustice on the local level in Philadelphia, but also the work that he's done nationally. And so we were able to lean on his work and also the work of Dr. Vivian Gatson at, uh, at Penn GSE, who's done a lot of work around this uh, topic. 
and also Dr. Ed Brock and Brow. So our dean and our president were real, and our, uh, our provost is an African-American male, Wendell Pritchett, who was born and raised right there in Philadelphia. So the line of connection that we have between the local community and the university was already there. But what I found very, again, pleasantly surprised as an African-American student who's had my own struggles within my department. I think we all have our own personal stories <laughs> of our PhD experience, but receiving email after email after email that at some point was kind of stressful. I know someone brought that up earlier, but reading an email from my president saying, we, our thoughts are with our African-American students, that meant a lot because it meant that someone sat down and thought about how this was having an impact on not just our studies, but our lives. And I'll finish by saying as someone who, uh, my family dealt with two police inv involved shootings uh, well before Twitter was a hashtag, the NAACP came in and supported our family. Um, there's one female faculty member in my department and she emailed me and said, I'm just emailing to check on you and see if you're okay. And she's the only person in my department that reached out to me. And so I wanna make sure for the faculty members and staff members and those who are in high up positions, those type of things really, really matter to students because I was shocked when I received the email because I honestly didn't expect it, uh, but that meant a lot to me. And so I know that's more on the personal side, but I salute um, Penn because they moved and they moved swiftly to make sure students knew they cared. Thank you for sharing that. Um, next, we have William Jackson. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm a third year PhD student at Florida International University. Um, going for my PhD in public affairs. I'm also a graduate research assistant and teaching assistant. Um, pretty much Florida International University has taken an active approach in addressing issues centered on racial injustice and social inequities especially after the death of George Floyd. On May 30th, the president of the university, Mark Rosenberg, acknowledged the senseless and wrongful deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and others before them. He also expressed that these individuals are victims of injustice. On June 3rd, FIU hosted a conversation titled, I Can't Breathe, Racial Injustice, Racial Unrest in America in the Wake of George Floyd's Death with President Rosenberg, FIU Police Captain Darius Moss, and NBC6 Local News and others within the FIU community. On June 5th, President Rosenberg also hosted a virtual town hall to discuss diversity, unity, and action within the FIU community. This gave students, faculty, and the staff the opportunity to express what was in their hearts and on their minds during this crucial time in American history. The town hall focused on looking for answers and discussing next steps for the university. The goal is for FIU to play an important role in promoting racial equity and understanding. On June 12th, President Rosenberg asked three university community leaders to serve as a core advisory group to review and recommend initiatives that will enhance equality, dignity, inclusion, and belonging. Seeking for permanent reforms that will make the community and the world a better place. This project is called the Equity Action Initiative. On September 14th, the President and Provost Kenneth G. Fortin appointed Vice President for Human Resources L. Painter K., also known as E.K. Hudson, to Senior Vice President for Human Resources and the University's first Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. With her appointment, the university created a new division dedicated to addressing inequities at the university. Also, Dr. Valerie Patterson, a committee member of the Equity Action Initiative, was also appointed as the new director of the African and African Diaspora Studies Program in the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. The members of the Equity Action Initiative Committee provided the president with recommendations in the Equity Action Initiative proposal, which is about a 206 page document that focuses on increasing the number of tenured black faculty and black employees in leadership positions, enhancing the African and African diaspora program, improving recruitment and retention of black students and providing additional police training. I would also share the link um, to the new form division and also a copy of the Equity Action Initiative final proposal. Thanks again for your time and looking forward to this 
thoughtful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Simran. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Oh, yes, you did. Thank you very much. So, uh, Satrikal, my name is Simran Kaur, and I am a PhD candidate at Miami University in the Department of Educational Leadership in Oxford, Ohio. My, Miami University is built on land that is indigenous Miami tribal land. Often people think we're out in Florida. Uh, but I will answer the questions myself and my peers were asked on the panel to consider in the order in which they were presented. So first, do I find that all people at my school embrace equity and inclusion? I'm going to use the words of our university's president. So all of us, students, faculty, staff, alumni, and community members, um, in order for us to come together and act with courage and determination to make Miami everything it can be, a place where every person can learn, grow, and thrive, we have much work to do to reach the values that we proclaim. So in short, we have work to do before I, as a graduate student, can confidently state that all embrace equity and inclusion at Miami. Uh, second, how important are statements supporting BLM issued by universities versus specific concrete actions? And what are some examples of each that I found to be powerful? So qualitative research on institutional diversity and in particular, the life of written documents reveals that all too often university leaders consider that simply issuing public statements or writing down campus related policies relate to the effect of equity and inclusion means that equity and inclusion has been achieved in the act and that's not the case uh, that's a good place to start but the act of issuing statements uh, that might lend support for the movement for black lives matter which is a global movement for some for some it's only domestic um, or condemning police brutality and racist violence does not necessarily mean that everyone at the university is on the same page when it comes to the objectives and the steps that need to be taken or um, even affirming that you know equity inclusion or racial justice are an issue um, in fact as protests took place um, regarding George Floyd off campus in our small community in Southwest Ohio. Many students, uh, both undergraduate and graduate, also protested at the local courthouse. Um, and an incident happened where a retired tenured faculty member um, was recorded on film yelling racial epithets and slurs um, at the protesters. And it went viral and then there was a university petition for the university to act um, and address and you know, state what steps they could take regarding um, this particular retired tenured faculty member who, um, whose class was still offered, but students were given the option to drop and then take an alternative class. So the response the university gave was definitely powerful. I think it was um, very important that the university president and leadership acknowledged that those are not a part of what Miami's values need to be. And at the same time, you know, showing us what steps we would have to take. So with that said, what are some of the impediments to dismantling institutional racism or being able to get to doing the work that we have to do? And why are we still dealing with this issue? So from my lived experiences as a you know, graduate student, uh, what I see as the biggest impediment are institutions not wanting to be held liable when there are incidents of bias, discrimination, and harassment, uh, even when there might have a biased incident report policy or even an excellent chief diversity officer or my, they might even have mandated or required student faculty and staff annual diversity or cross-cultural competency trainings. Um, at the core I think uh, of all of this is that when it comes down to the bottom line you know our universities um, wanting to hold people accountable or are they being risk averse um, when it comes to concerns related to liability. And I think, um, you know, given just my own background, not just in education, but having worked in the private sector for a very long time before, people generally don't want to be liable. They want to reduce liability. So the ways that I think that my university and other universities are uh, addressing this impediment is by, of course, creating those task forces that bring these opinions to the forefront, that share these stories. But one thing at Miami University that I want to pinpoint uh, from their diversity, equity, inclusion task force is 
instituting and establishing a civil rights officer within the office of the general counsel so that when there are issues related to civil rights of um, racial, ethnic, uh, any type of minority, religious minority on campus, that there is someone on the university who can highlight how this is not just um, you know discrimination or harassment, but also a civil rights you know issue. Um, and then last, I'll close. What will success feel like to me and within universities and at large? So of course, success will mean for me graduating, right? But far greater than the individual successes of myself and my pan and my peers who are on this panel today, is that you know at Miami when the next South Asian Punjabi Sikh immigrant woman comes into a graduate program or any other woman of color or person of color behind me, that they won't have to experience the same kind of, you know, relentless racial aggressions that I might have had to experience in my academic journey on campus. And that if they do, that the institution will have had, you know, advanced, you know, far beyond just a bias incident report policy or having, you know, a VP of diversity or a chief diversity officer or a civil rights, um, you know, attorney, it would be having more of like a restorative process in place. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, Saran. Um, so I want to see if um, other members of the panel want to um, respond to, to some of those more specific questions um, that um, were addressed there. Um, I guess let's, I'll call out each one just to um, remind you. So the first question was colleges and universities are often classified as progressive institutions. Do you find the messages of equity and inclusion is embraced by all at your schools? Do any of the other panelists want to comment on that one? I'll start the comment on Sarah Jane. Um, I do find that these messages are embraced by many, if not all at UMBC um, in any school. And obviously I work at Hopkins, so I see that as well. Um, the very ethos of public administration is to implement policies and programs to benefit citizens. And we all have dedicated uh, advanced studies to this and our careers to carry out this duty as evidence on the panelists' um, backgrounds. Um, I think we are at a point, however, that we should be beyond embracing these messages, that we must now pivot to ask ourselves and constantly at that, at how and what can we do as practitioners, as academics, how can we thoughtfully weave the message into concrete actions? Um, far too often, we look at this, um, at this topic as a standalone issue. Um, when I deal with cities across the country on how they use their performance management um, processes, they look at it as a standalone one topic, that it should be um, embedded into the cornerstone of every public administration policy making um, in every single aspect, every act that we do in public policy and administration, that this must be embedded, not just as a standalone, but a part of everything that we do. Because um, the message is loud and clear. This year was the exclamation point to that, um, if we can agree on that. So for me, if I had to answer that question is, let's, we're beyond embracing this. Let's start doing the work that needs to be done. Yeah, thank you. It's kind of a combination of the first and second questions about the extent to which the statement is sufficient. No, it's great. I mean, I, I like the uh, comprehensive response. So um, Tina or William, would you like to follow up on that topic? I was going to add, like, I don't know if I can say everyone or every department at the institution. I mean, you can Google some of the challenges that we've had at Penn and some of the comments that some faculty members have made over the years. And other faculty members responded and, you know, and this was well before this year. Um, I'll give an example. When I was entering as a first year, one of the articles I read was that a law professor uh, at Penn made a comment about black students and their inability to perform at the same level as other students. And as you can imagine, it was just, it was shocking. Um, but another professor responded and she was kind of attacked for responding and, and taking up for students. So we've had our issues and I think that's the anyone who's been watching the news, that's true for the IVs across the board. They've been facing issues and things have been uh, disclosed. So I can't say yes. I think also just throughout campus, I think everyone would agree that depending on what department or school that you're in, we're pretty segregated. And so there are issues for students, um, depending on what department or what school they're in. I'm a Fontaine Fellow and it's an, a society for 
PhD students of color and you get to the table and you're sitting next to an engineer student or an art student or an African studies student and you're hearing about these challenges that students are facing. So I can't automatically say that I think everyone is, is, has bought in, but I agree with the other panelists that we are so beyond, uh, we are so beyond talking. And I, again, I, I know that, you know, not all African Americans are the same and not all African American experiences are the same because I'm from a rural town in Arkansas with 850 people. Um, most African Americans I meet at Penn, they don't even understand my upbringing or where I'm from. But I, I think for a long time, we've been waiting for someone to do something. And with everything that's happened this year, again, receiving those emails and, and, and having people reach out made me think like, why didn't this happen 10 years ago? Why does it take another person dying on camera for someone to actually do something? And it's something I've been, I've struggled with for 10 years because that's how long it's been since my family dealt with our situation, actually 15 years since the first situation happened. And now because of social media and I have three or four friends who have the DEI positions and every time one of my, my twin sister and I, every time one of our friends gets a DEI position, we're like, okay. But then they're the one person who's now charged with doing a million things. They don't have teams and it just, it seems unrealistic. One of my friends is a DEI uh, at a university in Virginia and he has been pulled to do so many presentations on top of his regular workload. So, and then he, he'll say, you know, but nothing happens. I present and then there's no follow up. And I don't want to harp on that too much, but I'm just saying that that's what we're seeing also as, as PhD students. There are a lot of, a lot of webinars, a lot of meetings, <laughs> but I haven't seen actual institutional change. Um, or an actual, you know, and maybe that's going to take time. And I don't know what that looks like. But I know within my department, I've made some recommendations. I'm now that I'm done with the coursework, I've gained a little confidence to say I shouldn't be the only black student in the department when black students are performing at the lowest level in the country, along with Native American students, like, we probably need to think about bringing some other people in here that look somewhat like me, but that's all. Thank you. William, would you like to add to that? Yes, I'll probably add on to what um, Tina just expressed about, you know, those who are asked to do this work at the universities is, is very limited. I actually had an opportunity to speak with a couple of professors um, at FIU before um, coming here to speak on the panel because I want to know what was their take and their feel on how things are being handled at FIU. And as you guys may know, FIU means Florida International University. So everyone is like, wow, that means it's very diverse and you guys don't have these issues. However, that's very far from the truth, you know, um, because we are, FIU is in a majority minority county, which the majority minority are Hispanics. And the Hispanics within Miami-Dade County is a little different than what is perceived by Hispanics, I think, across the nation, because it's more of a Hispanic group that identifies themselves as white and a Hispanic group that pretty much sees themselves as, you know, at a different level than any other other minority counterparts. So the dynamics at FIU is very interesting and one that I think needs further researching because even when you speak with some other Hispanic groups, they feel disenfranchised by certain Hispanic groups within Miami-Dade County. So we have to be more intentional about what does being a minority or being a majority minority county mean for um, how we implement policies and things of that nature within the university level or outside within the broader community because I know from what I've been informed by some of the professors was that less than 1% of the professors at FIU that have tenure or tenure track positions are black and it's less than 1%. And to me, that's like, you know, wow, that was kind of like a jaw dropper because I'm like, this is Florida International University and African-Americans make up about 15% of the population. So why are we 
not having representation. And I, and I had to start to reflect on my own department as an African-American male. I'm actually the only African-American male within my PhD department, even though we do have other black males, but there's a distinction between being African-American and being Caribbean. So those who are African-American who are the descendants of people that have been here since the 16, 17, 1800s, there is no representation. And a lot of times we're pretty much glossed over as a community. And when I say we, I mean the African-American community because there are so many other communities that are communities of color. And once you really go down to understanding like what is actually happening with the African-American community, the situation or the problems are a lot worse than what we're seeing in the data that we're currently collecting because we're not being, in my opinion, intentional of trying to see what is actually occurring amongst these different social groups. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. On the flip side, I do a lot of work with law enforcement also from my practitioner side. And when I think about academia, I'm like, it is only so much you can do in that bubble if you only focus on that bubble but you have, to find, you have to find ways to be able to connect also with your surrounding communities because that will also have an impact on how change is made within your respective university. Thank you. Um, that's a good segue to um, the next question if um, others on the panel wanna weigh in on the question about what you see as some of the impediments to dismantling institutional racism, um, which is a big question, but um, why are we still dealing with this issue? So I'd like Can to hear I, if you have any additional thoughts about what some of the impediments are that, that we're facing. Sorry to jump in. I really uh, want to speak to this specifically dealing with uh, the academy. I think, um, and this may not be specifically answering your question, but we actually had a former professor, she's no longer at Penn, who wrote about this. Some of you may recall this piece by Dr. Mary Beth Gassman, why don't universities have more faculty of color? And she said, it's because they don't want them. And one thing I've found is that um, we, our department had a turnover of three faculty members and we went, my first year as a PhD student was spent half of the time in hiring me meetings and lunches. And we, they, we brought in scholars of color, but it was almost like there was never really an expectation to hire them. Like they were kind of just brought in to fill a space of like, okay, well, we interviewed someone, but we, they're not the best person for the job or we're specifically looking for an economist. And I remember one time my, my response was, well, if we're looking for a black economist to come into an education school, like we'd have to go to everyone who has a PhD in economics and ask them, you know, it almost seems like the intentionality wasn't there to begin with to, to hire them. But I think also when we look at our faculty, I think the NCES says that most of the, the full professors are, it, full professors are still 80% white, uh, male and female, and, you know, the, the process of becoming tenure seems painful. You know, I, I don't have any uh, plans to go into the academy, but I don't see the actual real effort to diversify the academy. I, I and my twin sister is a professor at FIU and William, she, I hear her stories all the time. And she went to Purdue. This was a challenge at Purdue. It, I mean, between the two of us, we have seven degrees from seven different institutions and the problems are the, <laughs> the same everywhere we've been across the country with getting more black faculty in this, 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 I know one of the banking CEOs, bank CEOs said recently, like we don't have more black people because they're, we can't find them or they're not available. And someone posted this in the chat earlier, um, you know, HBCUs produce the, HBCUs and MSIs produce quality candidates uh, for programs all the time. I don't see, uh, especially the IVs recruiting students for their PhD programs. You know, we just wait for people to show up, but there's no intentional effort to recruit people of color to go into these PhD programs. And a lot of people would go into them if they felt like they were actually welcome. And then of course, once you get there and the way you're treated and the way you feel um, is a whole nother situation, but I just don't see the intentional effort to diversify the academy. I just, I, I, 
I hope I'm wrong and someone has a different feeling or story, but that's just what I've experienced and heard. Thank you. Um, any other panelists want to weigh in on that? Rudy? Yes, thank you, Sarah Jane. Um, I want to expand a little bit on what I said earlier. You know, we talk about it as, we talk about this whole topic as a standalone issue. I worked in the government and the private sector for over 12 years. Um, and they look at institutional racism. They look at DEI as, again, oh, we got to check off this box, got to hire this person, do this, have this kind of office. And it stops there. We do so many service provision, product provision in the city of Baltimore, in Washington, D.C., and in private sectors. At the same time, these practitioners, these government practitioners, these private practitioners, they look to the academic partners, to the scholars, to the researchers, to the people that are in this meeting for guidance. And I think that's where the, the work needs to happen, where the rubber meets the road is for us to stop dealing with this issue, is that for us, in academia to be able to recognize that this has to be embedded in every single course, in every single discussion that we're having in the classroom, and that it spill out into the streets from our boardrooms to our capitals. Thank you. Um, I have been um, reminded to um, turn this to q and A. I, I really appreciate all of the input that um, all of the um, commentary that you've already provided the panel. I think you're very um, well informed about these things and I appreciate you trying to articulate your experiences and your perceptions. I think it's been a lot of valuable um, information, but there are many people I think um, on the call who are eager to ask you some questions. So I would ask people to please turn on their cameras and mics and use the hand raise functionality if you have a question and I will try to um, change my view here so that I can see everybody um, and try to call on people who have questions. I think that's my job. I don't know. Okay, Thomas Durfrey, I think. Can I ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, fifth year PhD student in applied economics. Um, over the the summer, our students were interested in trying to engage in this conversation in a more meaningful way as well. And one kind of salient cleavage that I think developed early on were African students versus black African American descendants of slavery, right? There's a, there's a different context that's there that's trying to be provided in these discussions, but the international African students didn't feel like they had that context. So when they were trying to process what was going on around them, there was some difficulty there because some students wanted to have a greater conversation. Other students felt, well, do we really feel like this department is the appropriate place for this? This really, you know, do I trust the department to handle this conversation well? Do you have any uh, insights for, I guess, thinking about the the point that you were bringing up uh william earlier talking about you know the difference between being jamaican versus descendants of slavery right do you have any nuance that you think needs to be inserted into these kinds of conversations i would say probably the best thing to do is to provide space for those conversations um i myself i grew up in south florida in fort lauderdale florida and most of my friends are Caribbean and um, and some of my best of friends are actually from Africa, uh, specifically Nigeria. And we have these conversations. We've had these conversations since we were children because there is a narrative that's put out there toward, against African-Americans. Um, when before a lot of people come here from the Caribbean or even from um, places within Africa, they're told do not assimilate with African-Americans. African-Americans are lazy. African-Americans are not trying to do anything. They're not doing anything with their life. So when you come to America, make sure that you keep your distance from them. 
And it's interesting because it seems like we get this amnesia because I'm like most of the civil rights and everything that a lot of people have benefited from in this country have been due to African Americans and other supporters, you know, bringing these things to the forefront. Um, and we have the candid conversations even now as an adult in my 30s and with my adult friends, you know, because there is it's very hard to shake off what people are telling you and what the images are telling you. You know, you hear, oh, you know, black on black crime, but I'm like, white people murder and kill and do things to each other at a higher rate than black people do. But it's never, you never hear the narrative of white on white crime, but it's these symbols and these images and things that are thrown out there about this specific group that it's not even true, you know, because even people will tell me like when I open my mouth at school, they'll be like, where are you from? And I'm like, I'm from here. Well, where are you from? I'm like, I'm African American. Oh, you guys are still around that exists down here. You know, th th that's the feedback I would get. And I'm like, yes, like my family is from the South and you know, yes, I was born in California, but my roots go deep into Virginia, all through the Carolinas, Florida, and other areas of the South, but we're still here. Oh, you're not locked up? How did you escape? I'm like, wow, like, but that's the narrative that's put out there. So I think in academia, we have to have these critical conversations, but we have to provide the space for these real conversations. Um, and I like what Sim Simran, spoke about with restorative justice because I'm actually, I actually served on the Florida Restorative Justice um, Association Board. And I think that's one of the things academia needs to put in place is trying to provide space for restorative justice to be able to have the forefront because that's when you'll be able to repair a lot of this harm that has already been caused in our country. Thanks, William. I, I wanted to add on something to the to Thomas real quick to, to answer that question. I appreciate what William says about creating space, uh, but something that I've struggled with when a lot of um, uh, non-Black or white faculty members try to create space is that they end up replicating um, is what they end up doing is they end up segregating students. I don't know how else to say it. Um, and a lot of times, and I'm all, like you said, William, like restorative justice is important, healing spaces are important, but then there's a difference when you're trying to raise awareness and have like honest dialogue for everybody in a group to understand what the issues are. So Thomas, I would say that if, you know, your school is trying to have these cross-cultural dialogues with, within intra-groups or other groups, uh, part of the reason why those challenges come up is because people are already talking in echo chambers. Um, and then in the interest of healing, sometimes I think what people do is they have like whites only group or blacks only group or the non-black people of color group. And yes, those spaces need to exist and have a place, but I also think we need to have like people all together and dealing with that tension that comes up when we share these stories and sitting with that discomfort. And I think a lot of times faculty uh, don't want to, you know, sit with that tension and everyone gets uncomfortable, especially when people are hurt. Um, so I would just recommend that, that bring people together, put them in the space. And only 5% of colleges in the United States are restorative justice in the sense that they have uh, student accountability or any type of uh, institutionalized process that ha that is specifically re re restorative justice framework oriented, only 5%. Can I make a comment? Yeah. That's okay, Sarah. Um, so this was a little bit to what William said, but also to what um, Simran, is, it, is that right, said. Um, so I love what William said because within the black community, again, as I said earlier, different people have different experiences. So ironically, my younger sister ran track at FIU and my twin sister is a faculty member at FIU. And again, we come from a place where there were no, uh, there were no people of Caribbean descent or African, uh, or African people in our community. Our community was 85% white and 15% black. We may have had one Hispanic family. And when I went to college, that's something that was very startling and shocking to me. I would go to the Caribbean student events and the African student events, and they were surprised that I was there. And that was just so shocking to me to learn as a college student that this is how other communities felt about us. But what it actually 
pushed me to do was become self-educated about my own history because my, and I think this is true for a lot of people in America, unfortunately, we don't learn about our history. And so someone brought up the 1619 project earlier and I'm a former social studies teacher. And most of what I taught my students, I had to teach myself in graduate school and undergrad because I didn't learn it at all in K through 12. And so when we wanna have these conversations, I think it's so important for people to come to the table having educated themselves first. You can't lead a discussion about a topic that you know nothing about. And I learned that the hard way. When I student taught, I, my master's degree is from Harvard University. I moved to Boston, did not realize that there really weren't any African Americans in Boston. Uh, I lived in Dorchester, so I found the space where they were. But when I taught at Cambridge Ridge in Latin, which is a public high school in, in Cambridge, um, none of my students were American. Most of them were from Africa or the Caribbean. And, and many of them were learning American history for the first time from me. And I realized I have the power to teach these young people a different narrative. And then they all went back to their family and said, you know, we have this teacher, she's from Arkansas <laughs> and she's teaching us all of this stuff. And I'm learning that even as a PhD student, not all faculty members know history and not all PhDs no American history and we have to stop leaning on folks just because we believe they're an expert in a certain field to have all of the answers. We have to educate ourselves and continue to learn because you have me and William with two totally different lived experiences and so we can't assume things about people but we have to encourage everyone to learn more and want to grow. The comments about um, the Afro-Caribbean, it's so true, you know, these comments about that people are making about slavery and being from the island, I just, you know, I try to wrap my, my mind around the fact that we simply don't know. And so please self-educate and help others do the same. Thank you. We have lots of people um, who want to ask questions now. So um, Peter Zayas, I think you were next. I think I unmuted, so I think you should be able to hear me. Uh, thank you for all the panelists. Uh, I've been a college student for 40 years, so I've dealt with extensively with all these racial issues in education. Currently, I'm a third year PhD student in public and urban policy who's completed 57 of the 60 credits that are academically required for a PhD. I retired as a police officer after 20 years of service and for the past seven years as an independent self-funded researcher, I'm seeking to answer the question, what is the best way to ensure that a police department is accountable to the community that it serves? My problem, as a member of a minority group that has been historically discriminated against no organization is willing to fund my work unless I advocate for their agenda. And academically, I am unable to proceed with my dissertation because no faculty member is willing to sit on my dissertation committee except one who happens to be African American. What are my options? Yeah, Peters, uh, that you're dealing with it, like you're in the thick of it. Um, I think that for you, I think it might be a very real option to explore if your program or institution has what it takes to support you, right? And is, is being a good fit in that. Um, and then also, um, I think you need to ask like, who are your allies, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, on campus, if there are any. My outside. wife is my ally. Right, right. And the partners are so important in graduate journeys, and building that support network is so important as well. Uh, but, you know, ask yourself who are your allies on campus that can, you know, influence, um, you know, the development of a committee that believes in you and the work that you've done. Uh, clearly, you're ready to move to the next stage, like you're, you're at that point where you're building a committee. Um, but I, I don't, know, again, know if, you know, if it's unrealistic at this point to really ask 
because sometimes it is a change. I know graduate students sometimes do have to change and find um, the right fit and the right campus. Um, and sometimes when we do our searches and review our programs, you know, not everything is as it appears on paper. But I wish you the best of luck and thank you for your vulnerability and taking that risk and like sharing what that very real challenge is for you. And it's why a lot of graduate students drop out. That's why there's so <laughs> few of us because we don't find that community. I mean, we check that bubble for some measure, but then, uh, yeah. Sorry, um, I completely um, sympathize with you there, Peter. Um, and to echo what William said earlier and with Tina, you know, having that space and that um, context that we're discussing. I work as an advisor to government administrators. Um, I work with agencies. Um, in this year's context, um, with the discourse, the social discourse that we're having, my organization at Johns Hopkins University was reflecting on, do we even work with police departments? Do we just completely shut them out? I've worked in the city of Baltimore for about 10 years. And I had an engagement with the city of a city in New Jersey where they wanted to work on looking at the data in the police department to see how they can better improve their downtown, the safety of their downtown to invite more people into the streets. My organization wanted to walk away from that engagement. Knowing my background in Baltimore City and knowing that a lot of the things that the services that we provide, the programs that we provide as city administrators are all tied together. I felt that it was a disservice for me to walk away from engaging with the police department. They're still a necessary part of our, of our public service delivery. And I think that for you, as Simran said, you know, it's just a matter of having those conversations and finding your allies, finding who sees, you know, the same glint that, that you see in this, in this issue? And Peter, they may not be at your institution. I just added in the, <laughs> the comment, Rayshawn Ray at Maryland is just the first person I thought of. I was on an APAM per, uh, panel earlier this summer and a young lady was a sixth year criminology PhD student at Pittsburgh. And she shared some of the same type of uh, stress and concerns. And I recommended that she look for students and professors at other universities as an outlet for getting new information. Because as the panelist says, sometimes it's not at your university that you find the folks who inspire you the most. Thanks everyone. We have two more questions, people um, waiting to ask, and then hopefully we'll be able to wrap up by three o'clock. But next is EJ Scott. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for allowing me to um, uh, make this uh, statement. I, first of all, I want to shout out to Tina. I'm a girl from Arkansas as well, and uh, we've had some of the same path. I went to Boston uh, University, uh, Boston College, and then came to Howard. So um, great to see you out there. We'll have to meet sometime. Um, and but. What I wanted to say was similar to um, what Tina said, because earlier in the program, there was um, uh, one of the panelists talked about uh, history and telling the truth. And I would like to, uh, and I think that is so important that because African-American history, black history has been wiped clean from so many slates that we don't get to hear the truth about all the wonderful, incredible things that black people have done in this country. And uh, so that not being able to hear that truth, it simply um, uh, continues to um, uh, lead to these stereotypes about us and we are a myriad of interesting people. My background is in science chemistry, um, but we must um, tell our history and tell the truth about our history. And I was wondering if any of those universities that you all are attending now are sort of um, trying to rectify um, what has been done to black history and trying to make sure that the truth is out there now rather than 
uh, the stereotypes so that others, particularly those who come to this country, who are fed those lies through uh, uh, old television shows and all types of things, are, uh, aren't misled as much. At Miami University, we have um, a project called the Truth and Reconciliation Project that I'm involved with, uh, with our Vice President of Institutional Diversity. And it is a partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative um, in which we are acknowledging racial justice terror lynchings that happened in Southwest Ohio, um, not too far from our university campus, where two African American men were taken out of jail and wrenched by a mob. Um, and that is recent history. The descendants of those victims are still living in our community. Um, and there are, you know, archives in the local library and elsewhere that speak to this injustice, the, the harm, racial motivated, racial terror lynchings against African Americans in the late 19th, early 20th century that were never brought to justice. So I Excuse feel me, that- can I, can I interrupt just one moment? I know um, that those are important to let people know what happened. We hear so much about Tulsa when there were over 30 wonderful, thriving cities like Tulsa that uh, were burned down and attacked by white mobs. And no one knows about those, but it's not so much knowing about the lynchings and all of that. It's telling the truth about how when African Americans came out of enslavement, the incredible things that they did in this country. That's the truth that needs to be told rather than saying that uh, we were lazy and stuff. I mean, how can you be lazy working 18 uh, hours a day in the fields? So, I mean, it's just a ridiculous uh, uh, premise that's out there. So those are the stories. We know about the lynchings. We know that that happened. We want to hear all the wonderful things that we did. Absolutely. Absolutely. You make a great point. I'm going to wrap up really quickly. My point in bringing the lynchings up was, again, not to bring up like this deficit perspective that's very rampant in higher education, right? That African Americans and racial minorities are views with a deficit lens, definitely. My point in bringing that up was to answer the part of the question, what are universities doing when it comes to truth and justice? And so I'm thinking of examples of universities locally, um, Miami being one example with that project. I've read in the news other universities like William and Mary putting up monuments specifically related to wrongdoing and acknowledging that um, in their time and place uh, where those campuses are located. So yes, those, those are just one aspect. And what you're saying, ma'am, absolutely agree with it. But when it comes to what are universities doing, I think it's very powerful that there is an admittance of wrongdoing and that there is some type of reconciliation at these local levels happening. Um, that's all. I, one thing I wanted to add was, uh, it's, I'm involved with the National Council for Social Studies and still very passionate about K through 12 social studies. I think when the country took a shift uh, in the direction of focusing on STEM, we kind of pulled away from civic education and we see where that's gotten us, right? And so EJ, what I hear you asking and what I thought of was also the university's role in using the power that they have to influence the K through 12 curriculum. Um, so Brookings, I believe, wrote a piece, I'll never forget this a couple of years ago, that you can get a degree in history and not take a US history course. What are the actual courses that are being taught on university campuses and what are we requiring students to take? Because you can go to a four year institution and not take a single US history class. And so you're not getting any of the truth because you're probably not even getting, you know, the basic minimum of, of US history. And when you speak about uh, reconstruction, I, so I've been doing some research, EJ, sorry, this is an Arkansas thing, on the, the role that African Americans played in Arkansas during reconstruction. We had more black people in, the, in our state house and Senate in the, during reconstruction than we do now. I never learned that in Arkansas history. So again, we have, the academy has the power to go to governors and secretaries of education and say, you, you need to change your curriculum. You need to make sure when students graduate from high school, they know these things. And honestly, that's something that I've pushed on Penn a little bit and I brought up in many of my courses is, 
where are the universities when it comes to some of these issues that we're seeing at the K through 12 level? Where is the influence on it? I know OK said that earlier about how are we teaching people how to get involved um, in politics and policy. But again, it goes back to what are we teaching our students in K through 12? Because once they leave high school, we have no right or really a pipeline to force people to teach themselves or learn. And so I think a lot of this is the academy using its power to influence policy on the K through 12 level, because if we don't change what students are learning and how they're learning, we're going to see some of these same issues over and over again. And we'll be talking about this in 10 years, hopefully not on a webinar. Thank you. We have one final question from um, Shannon Williams, who's been patiently waiting, so. Okay, hi everybody, I'm Shannon. I'm from George Mason University. I'm actually the director of PhD student services in the Shar School of Policy and Government. So I'm in a student affairs role and I have a whole lot of things that I was gonna say to like back up this question, but I'm just gonna jump to it because we're at the end. Um, so first, thank you for everything that you've shared today. It's super useful. I'm wondering from, for folks that are in the role that I'm in, which student affairs, whether in the unit or at the university level, has there been anything in particular that you've seen happen that, that's been like particularly, yes, that's something that is really useful in terms of moving forward um, racial justice and dealing with white supremacy at the university or creating space or advocating, what's something that you've either seen happen at your institution that's been awesome or something that you really wish people in a role like mine would do um, in one of those spaces? Because We are trying to really do this, but we're in this place of um, not knowing, you know, we can't do everything, right? And if we try to do everything, we're gonna do it poorly. Um, so it'd be great to know if you've seen anything really work that we might be able to take away. Thank you. I will start off by saying one of the things I've seen that worked currently is the responsiveness of the leadership at FIU. Um, and that comes from the president. I think by him being very responsive towards the situations that have been occurring. Also, we had a situation not too long ago at FIU when um, the um, senior um, HR person, Mrs. Hudson, was promoted. You had a you had some very derogatory and racist comments that were made through social media, and the president of the university he took swift action and he handled that and he spoke against it because I think it does come down to leadership um, by the president of the university saying like we're not tolerating this even though this might be something that's tolerated outside of FIU, we're not gonna to tolerate this in FIU and we're gonna do everything as possible to you know, take care of this when it does occur. So I think the responsiveness of leadership, so even within the departments, even with professors, because I think from my experience, a lot of professors kind of shy away from even one even discuss anything dealing with racism and I think that hurts, you know, just our growth as a society or even in academia. I think we have to find ways of being comfortable with speaking of these things when we see it. But the president, by him taking swift and a quick approach and addressing those situations as they've been occurring, I think has been great on our end in that way. There's a lot of work that we still have to do. But I think when you have a leader, such as your college president, who is genuinely being active and reactive and intentional, it makes a difference. It sets the tone for that environment for everyone. I agree with that, um, Shannon. Um, thanks for asking that question, because I think it in my own um, institution, um, Tina mentioned, you know, each time something occurred in her institution, that there was this targeted, this um, specific approach to the community that was affected. Um, and I think that's something that student affairs division across the country and across every institution, whether it's graduate or undergraduate, can take key on is to proactively and unequivocally reach out to those communities that are affected and begin those conversations and holding those spaces and holding, you know, and knowing the context before you even have those conversation. I think it's going to be very helpful um, to the community, to the student community at least. And I'll just add, and apologies, my internet went out for a little bit, um, but I'll give an example of something I think Rudy was just sharing. 
um, I mentioned a professor earlier, Howard Stevenson, who's been doing this work for decades. The president, our president, Amy Gutman, she very strategically and our dean leaned on things he was already doing. So on one of her emails, it was a list of videos and, and speeches that he had already done that she shared with us um, and a recommendation to read. Uh, I don't know if you, I recommend everyone watch the movie Just Mercy or read the book if you haven't seen it. Um, Howard Stevenson, the, the, the lawyer behind the story Just Mercy is Brian Stevenson, it's Howard's brother. And so um, again, we didn't have, you know, she didn't have to go out and scramble. She utilized the resources that were right there on campus, sending a video, a motivational message and targeting it to those students, I think is, is a good idea without segregating as our other panelists mentioned earlier. Right, thank you. Um, I'm going to call in Tara <laughs> to see if we're going to do breakout sessions or if we're going to wrap up or where we are. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to do, I'm going to put everybody in breakout rooms now. And again, if you didn't do the announcement at the beginning of the breakout rooms or there's no leaders or anything for the breakout rooms, I'm going to assign you automatically. There's about 50 some odd people left. Um, you'll be automatically just a smaller group to discuss the uh, issues that we have covered here today. And thank you so much to all the panelists and to Jane Cole and Sarah Jane Brubaker for, for moderating the discussion. Um, it, it, it'll be posted online in a next, the next week or so if you uh, want to revisit and point. But thank you. I hope is is the first in a, in a long line of, of rich discussions we have about this topic. So thank you very much for joining us today. And um, I will assign breakout rooms right now. Thanks again.